And we're going to continue with the seventh chapter of Wise Child, which is called The Attic. Wise Child just went through the very unpleasant experience of being coated with the herbs that she and Juniper had mixed together. Um, it was forcibly done to her by Juniper and Uni, which interestingly bothered me more as an adult to read about than as a child. This helped show that a wise child was actually um, Dorak, which is what they call the sort of witches that they are. Um, I That part of the book just made me really uncomfortable. I don't know how you feel about it upon hearing it. Um, but post this experience, Wise Child has decided that it means she is ready to see what is in Juniper's attic behind the ivory door. So we will continue from that point. My heart began to beat quickly as the door sw slowly swung back and Juniper's attic lay in front of me. My first impression was one of light. Not only were there windows on two sides of the room, but there were windows in the roof of it. Below the roof windows, in the center of the room, stood a huge upright loom and threads weighted with stones. I had often seen looms before. Many of I dimly remembered had a loom. But I had never seen one so large, nor one threaded in such a variety of colors. Women in our village either made clothes in the dull brown color you get from dyeing with crotal, or else they wove precious fabrics in red, white, and black, the colors of the Holy Trinity. There were certain reds, whites, and blacks in Juniper's work, but they were blended with greens and yellows, with blues and purples and violets, with browns and corals, vivid scarlets, and the most delicate pinks. The colors might have clashed and made a painful confusion of effects, but each graded so gently and subtly into the next, or else lay beside a color with which it was in such perfect harmony that the total effect was delightful. It made you feel glad as you looked at it. I stood there and looked for a long time, pleased and fascinated by the rainbow that Juniper was weaving. A little later I looked at the rest of the room. Hung from the ceiling was a mirror, and before I looked into it I guessed that it was a mirror like the one downstairs. Sure enough, as I sat upon the stool before the loom and looked up, I could see people busy about the life of the village. The room contained big cabinets. No longer afraid of what I would find in any house that belonged to Juniper, I opened one and found it full of dresses. They were made of rich silk, mostly in crimson, and they had a ceremonial air about them. Throwing off my blanket, I tried one of them on. It was much too big for me, but I loved the feel of the silk and the swishing sound it made. The other cabinet made me jump when I opened it. As the door swung back, it seemed to me for a moment that I was looking at a dozen faces. Then I realized that they were masks. Some grave, some smiling, all most beautifully crafted in the thinnest beaten metal. Apart from these cabinets and the loom, there was nothing else in the room except for wool, two dyeing vats, and some empty shovels. The shovels in use, lying between the threads of the work, the shuttle in use, lying between the threads of the work, was wound with the palest shade of grey. I began to examine Juniper's weaving again, this time from another part of the room so the pattern looked quite different, almost reminding me of something. When at that moment the door opened and Juniper came in, she smiled at me in a friendly way. Well, she said, as she had the day before. Well, I said. I knew that uh, as an intruder in this room, wearing Juniper's dress and looking at her things, I ought to have felt and looked ashamed, only I didn't feel ashamed, just happy. So it was useless to pretend. I do like it in here, I said. Good, come as often as you like. You don't mind? Not a bit. In fact, I knew you'd soon decide to come. What's it for then, the weaving? Look at it, the colours. What does it remind you of? I looked long and hard at the weaving, staring at it from various angles, turning my head on one side to see how it looked then. I kept getting the feeling I had when I first saw it, that it reminded me of something, but I still couldn't think what it was. I don't know, I said at last. What is it? Juniper didn't reply. She had that way of not answering you, yet not seeming rude or nasty the way people do when they won't reply. When I first came here, I told her, I thought the attic might be full of horrible things, like my cousin said, but it isn't, it's lovely. 
The next morning I felt perfectly normal, just as Juniper had said I would. In fact, life seemed boringly humdrum after the, after the thrill of my flight and wondering whether I, had de whether I was destined to become a Doran. Why is everything so dull? I grumbled. I think the dull bits are often the best, Juniper said. Too much excitement is very distracting. You just need it now and then to give you something to feed off. I didn't think I needed it just now and then. I wanted a lot of it. The next day, however, there was a sort of excitement I didn't enjoy at all. I was going down the cliff to Mass, as on so many Sundays, and although Juniper did not always come with me, on this occasion she did because there was a sick old lady she wanted to visit. As we reached the bottom of the stream, I had never liked crossing it much because there was no handrail, and halfway across you seemed a long way from either bank and if you looked down, you could see the water running underneath it in a way I did not like. Tilly did not like it much either, and Juniper always had to lead her. I had followed behind, feeling scared, but not too scared. This morning, however, the water was running much more quickly than usual. The streams high up in the mountains had come pouring down into our little stream, and probably some snow had melted up on the height, and the water was leaping and frothing and bubbling and making a loud noise, and occasionally making boulders bound as it tore along. Juniper walked ahead of me as usual, leading Tilly, but she did not notice until she got to the farther bank that I had stuck in the middle. I had looked down and had become rooted to the spot, paralyzed with fear, unable to remain upright. I had dropped to my knees, as I had when I was dizzy after flying, my hands clinging desperately to the planks on each side of the bridge. Juniper flung Tilly's reins over a branch, came back, lifted me bodily, she managed to do this in a quite gentle way, and carried me to the farthest bank where she sat me down. We walked on toward the church, neither of us referring to what had happened. When I had left her, however, I was inside the church at my prayers. My skin grew prickly with the horror at the thought that I would have to cross that bridge again in order to get home. I could not imagine how I could do it. Juniper was waiting, as usual, outside the church, and the two of us, with Tilly, set off immediately toward the bridge. As if both of us were aware of the of an ordeal ahead, neither of us spoke at all. Usually I chattered, with Juniper occasionally throwing in an interesting sentence or two. When we got to the bridge, Juniper behaved as if it was as if the morning scene had not occurred. She walked ahead with Tilly, and it was only when she reached the far side and she looked to see if I was following her. I wasn't, in fact. I had not even set foot on those trembling planks. If I thought that she would come back to carry me this time, I was mistaken. She sat down on a log on the other side of the stream with the air of someone who was prepared to wait for a long time. Quite sure that there was no way I would ever cross the bridge unless Juniper carried me, I too sat down on a rock and prepared for a long wait. Time began to pass very slowly indeed as I thought of the various possibilities. One possibility was that I might simply die of cold. It was not a very cold day, but it was quite bad enough. And I longed to be back home by the fire, also, I was getting hungry. Juniper had given me my usual slice of bread outside the church. I remembered with pleasure that I had not eaten all of it and spent a happy few minutes finishing the rest. But I knew that a chicken stew awaited me at the top of the cliff. There seemed no possible way of getting there. And if Juniper was not prepared to carry me or even prepared to bring me a bit of stew from her own dinner, then I could not imagine what was to become of me. No one could have lived with Juniper as long as I had without getting into the habit of pondering the why of things. As the minutes passed and nothing happened, I began to ask myself why it was that today I was so frightened. I had crossed that bridge many, many times, always with a slight quiver of fear, but never paralyzed with the horror of it as I was, I was today. Suddenly the truth came to me. It was the dizziness of the flying that was still troubling me. But that made no sense either. The dizziness had gone two days ago, and I could walk as well as ever, yes, but the helpless feeling I had when I was dizzy had brought up some more frightened feelings in me. I had always pushed down when I crossed this bridge. It was a terror of falling, of being lost and swept away, of losing myself, of not being wise child anymore. As if a door had opened, I suddenly thought of something else. Only the other night on my flying trip, as I had walked up the Great Stone Avenue, I had felt part of everything, part of animal and bird, tree and stone. If I was part of everything, then I was also part of bridge and stream. 
and the, sh of the sharp rocks beneath the water and the trembling rushing waters, even if I fell into the water, and even if I was swallowed up by them, I would still be part of it all. In such a world, such a universe, nothing terrible could happen to me. Suppose, I asked myself, just suppose that I walked across that bridge as if I was part of it and part of the water, that I decided that whatever happened as I did so, it would, it would be all right. What then? Suddenly, it was as if a weight was a it was a it was as if a weight had dropped off me. I stood up, walked to the bridge, and crossed it with only the slightest hesitation as I got to the middle. Juniper stood up as I reached the far bank and gave me one loving, comprehending smile, picked up to these reins, and started for home. One part of me felt relieved and rather proud, another part missed the thrill of being terrified. It had been exciting in a way. How muddling everything always was. And that is the end of chapter 7.